without further ado, I'd like to introduce Maria DeRico. Maria DeRico is the pseudonym for Ellen Byron, the author of the award-winning USA Today bestselling and Agatha award-winning Cajun Count Country Mysteries. Born in Queens, New York, she's first generation Italian American on her mother's side and the granddaughter of a low level Jewish mobster on her father's side. She grew up visiting the Astoria Manor and Grand Bay Marina catering halls, which were run by her Italian mother's family in Queens and have become the inspiration for her catering hall mystery series. Welcome, Maria. Thank you. And uh, forgive me if I get a little distracted. My 15-year-old dog is is decided to have a senior moment right now. I think he's doggy sundowning. So hi, everyone. Oh, well, you know, we we've got uh, we've got all got lives above and beyond our uh, author events. And I think we all understand. Thank you. So I'd also like to introduce Jennifer J. Chow. Jennifer is the lefty-nominated author of the Sassy Cat Mysteries and the forthcoming L.A. Night Market Mysteries. The first in the Sassy Cat series, Mimi Lee Gets a Clue, was selected as a recommended read by Overdrive, a Pop Sugar Best Summer Beach Read, and was one of BuzzFeed's top five books by AAPI authors. The latest novel, Mimi Lee Cracks the Code, was listed as one of 10 new must-read books by Bustle, one of the best books released in November by BuzzFeed, and the entire Sassy Cat series was called one of the best cozy mystery series to read right now by Book Riot. Jennifer currently serves as vice president on the National Board of Sisters in Crime. She's also an active member of Crime Writers of Color and Mystery Writers of America. Welcome, Jen. Hi, thanks for coming, everyone. And Cynthia Kuhn. Cynthia is an English professor and author of the Starlight Bookshop Mysteries and the Lyle and McLean Academ yeah, Academic Mysteries. Her work has also appeared in Mystery Most Edible, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, Copper Nickel, Prick of the Spindle, Mama PhD, and other public publications. Honors include an Agatha Award, a William F. Deke Malice Domestic Grant, and Lefty Award nominations. Originally from upstate New York, Cynthia lives in Colorado with her family. And today is her book birthday and everybody Yay. should go to your little reaction thing or clap on screen or all the above. Hooray, welcome Cynthia. Thank you, hi everybody. Thank you for coming. And finally, Becky Clark, a highly functioning chocoholic. Becky is the seventh of eight kids which explains both her insatiable need for attention and her atrocious table manners. She likes to read funny books, so it felt natural to write them too. She published her first novel in 2001 and is a sought after speaker. Welcome, Becky. Thank you. Hi, everybody. All right, so I'm going to turn off my uh, microphone and camera and turn this over to you all um, and we look forward to a delightful conversation. Hey. All right, thanks for creating conversations. So I'm the voluntold to be the moderator tonight. So I will be going over some questions, but it's going to be informal and we're just kind of just chat a little and just pass on the torch of questions to each other. Okay, so let me kick it off by asking what inspired your series? And I'm going to start with the book birthday gal. Yay! Finn, talk about your Yay. series. Yikes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, what inspired our series? So this series was inspired by my love of bookstores um, and, and just books in general. I just, my entire life have been... Um, I, a bookworm, I guess you could say. And uh, when the Lila McLean Academic Mystery Series kind of stopped, um, I thought, well, what, what do I want to write about? And I thought, you know, books. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so that's what, that's not an exciting story is that I need a better anecdote, but that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I thought, okay, well, what, what can I do with books? And then I went to a bookstore. I actually did work in a bookstore before I went to graduate school. So I have so much love um, for them and yeah, that's, that's what inspired it. 
I wondered what kind of mysteries I could do coming in and out of a bookstore. And that's turning out to be interesting because I needed to differentiate it um, from the other bookstore mysteries, which I read and love too. Um, so I had the main character become a literary event planner. So there's a lot of parties and, um, and that kind of stuff. I'll, ta we'll ta I'll tell you more later. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay. Becky, do you want to go next? I, I see you have a lovely scarf. On. I do have my lovely, I have my crossword scarf because my, uh, the, the new book, Fatal Solutions, is the third in my crossword puzzle mystery what, um, series. And what's prompted that was my love of crossword puzzles, which um, I got started by my dad. My dad's a big uh, cross, was a big crossword guy. And um, so I thought, you know, I'm looking, I'm searching around for a hook for a new series. And, um, and I thought, huh, I was kind of not really thinking about the series exactly, but I wanted to try my hand at creating crossword puzzles. Um, so I got some software and I tried my hand at that and it was kind of harder than I expected it to be. Um, but I, uh, I thought, well, this could be fun. So I have my, my protagonist in the crossword series, um, suffers from OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder, and um, she secretly makes crossword puzzles for the local paper. Um, and so I, I kind of was mashing all those things together because someone with OCD, organizational OCD like she has, um, would be really good at, um, at the crossword puzzle phenomenon. And in uh, my mystery writer series, um, Police Navidad is the fourth one of those. Um, my main character there is a uh, mystery writer, <laughs> so that just made everything so much easier because she, uh, um, you know, she doesn't want to solve mysteries, she wants to um, just write about them, and so I was, that started because I was reading something and um, uh, with a really kick-ass kind of uh, uh, sleuth, and I thought, God, I would never do that <laughs> in my, if that was my mystery, I would just never do that. I would hide under the covers. I would look for a grilled cheese sandwich someplace and I would just try not to do that. And so that's kind of the genesis of that. I thought, well, what would I do? What, how would I react to certain things? And so not that, um, not that Charlie is like me in any way, um, except her love for grilled cheese sandwiches and dogs. Um, but that's kind of how that one started. So both those series are uh, genocide. <laughs> What's the plural of genesis? What? Uh, what? Oh, oh, I was going to say, Ellen, you want to go first? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry, my dog is staring at me again. This is so disorienting. Um, so uh, for this, the um, Catering Hall Mysteries, and this is, uh, it's beginning to look a lot like murder, just released uh, about a month ago. Um, it, we're inspired by my real life. Uh, my, as in my bio that my family, my Italian family lived in Queens and two of the cousins by marriage ran um, catering halls. And one of which is where we had uh, our wedding, New York wedding reception, as opposed to our LA one. And um, it's it, where my character lives is where my Nonna lived. She, Nonna lived downstairs and Zizi Rose and Uncle Henry, it's Zia Rose, what we called it Zizi Rose from childhood. Um, they lived upstairs with their four kids. So now my protagonist lives upstairs and her grandmother lives downstairs. So it's extremely personal to me. And uh, the catering, uh, the Cajun country mysteries, which is I write as Ellen Byron, as I think a lot of you know, um, those were inspired by the passion I developed for the, uh, the, the region when I was going to school at Tulane University in New Orleans. So, um, so that is the genesis. What about you, Jen? Uh, well, I guess I'll do the Sassy Cat Mysteries. Um, and so this is, I, I think it's half my love for this idea of animals that we can communicate with because uh, Marshmallow, Marshmallow is telepathic in my series. So he can speak with his owner, Mimi Lee, who's a pet groomer in Los Angeles. She works at Hollywood, a pet grooming salon. And so I think part of it was just this idea of that human animal um, connection. And part of it was just getting that sassiness out from, I think, years of reading Garfield comics and just kind of channeling that sort of energy into Marshmallow. And of course, I said it in LA because that's where I live. And so I just wanted to, to do in a place I was familiar with and um, explore the area. 
So what about their most current book or books that you have out? Talk about the premise behind them. Becky, you're on. Uh, the premise behind them. Um, 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 okay, so in Fatal Solutions, um, she, uh, Quinn stumbles, She's she finds a piece of property that is in her mom's name and she doesn't, mom doesn't want to talk about it. So she goes out there and she uh, stumbles on a skeleton. And uh, so the mystery is, uh, it's near the, uh, Colorado where I live, they have um, the uh, uh, a Japanese internment camp. Um, and this is kind of set in the same place. And so I took some liberties with that, but um, so they're not sure, she's not sure if uh, the skeleton is from the internment camp from you know way back when, or if it's newer. I mean, it is a skeleton, it's not a dead body. <clears throat> so um, that kind of kicks off that mystery. Um, in Police Navidad, um, <laughs> that is uh, set, Charlie gets wrangled um, by her uh, upstairs neighbors who are like grandparents to her. She gets wrangled into writing and directing this Christmas play that is set with um, the senior center and an elementary school, kind of a joint project for the holidays. And um, so as you can see by the cover, Santa croaks. <laughs> so the, the uh, actor who's um, playing Santa, uh, he comes to a, a sad end. And so that's what kicks off that mystery in that one. Who wants to go next, Sin? I saw you unmute. Oh, uh, well, so I'll talk. Ready. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, birthday girl, you go. Okay. Birthday girl, you go. Okay. Um, so How to Book a Murder is about Emma Stars, who is a recent PhD who goes home to help save her family bookstore, which is in trouble. Um, she takes on the role of literary event planner in addition to book selling. Um, and agrees to host a murder mystery dinner party for her nemesis. And at the murder mystery dinner party, uh, someone is actually murdered. So she becomes an amateur sleuth to try to save her aunt and herself from the accusations that follow. Okay, now I'll go. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so in, uh, it's beginning to look a lot like murder. Um, the catering hall is uh, owned by a mob family, although it's run as a legitimate business. And uh, what happens is that a young man appears on the scene claiming to be uh, the long lost brother of uh, one of the characters, uh, which would mean that the father, who was the capo de capo, had an affair on his wife. So uh, Italian histrionics ensue. And uh, uh, as one character says, I've never been to an Italian opera, but is this what they're like? And the other character goes, yeah, pretty much. Um, and uh, when, and meanwhile, that the local, the seniors in the neighborhood are a bunch of, they're like cliques, um, like 80 year old mean girl cliques, and they're competing for the most best decorated block. And uh, as one of the displays is unveiled, uh, there are, it's a Santa's workshop and there are a couple of feet sticking out of the workshop and they don't belong to Santa or to an elf, they belong to a murder victim. So concurrently, you have the seniors duking it out for um, for best at greater block. And the the meanest of them is a woman who can, she's got a Tony Bennett Santa. It's an animatronic Tony Bennett who croons Christmas tunes. And her claim to fame is that her uh, husband is distantly related to Tony Bennett, who of course is actually a native son of um, Astoria. My mom went to high school with him, although he was ahead of her. So there is much uh, resentment and envy of this, uh, kind of nasty woman. So and it all ties in somehow. Oh, and I have to say that I was very proud of myself because there's also uh, Mia, my protagonist is running parties at the, one is a, a, a party for a sweet 16 and the other is a um, uh, first birthday party that's with a nativity theme and they wanted a living nativity. So I bring, I somehow, I'm very proud of myself for doing this, that a camel and a goat and, and a, the living nati nativity not only figures in the in the first birthday, it also figures into the Sweet Sixteen. So, I don't know if I'll ever be able to re 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 uh, get better than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess 
I'll, well, I don't know if I can top that. <laughs> oh yeah, you can. <laughs> Go for it. Mimi cracks the code. So mine is, um, so Mimi and her boyfriend Josh are supposed to go on this romantic getaway to Catalina Island, which is this, you know a nearby lovely island, and they have this vacation rental home, so lovingly gifted by their friend Pixie. But then their getaway turns sour when it turns out that the last renter uh, of the hotel room, I mean, hotel room, hotel, blah, 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 <laughs> of the house was found dead. And so then, you know, it's not as romantic anymore. And then there's like a, some like, you know, stolen goods kind of floating around too. So there's like kind of that secondary mystery too that that's happening on the island. So then it's up to Mimi and Josh and of course, Marshmallow to figure out what is really going on and, you know, solve the case. So I wanted to ask about all these different settings that we have because, you know, I was talking about Astoria and there's like Colorado and just all these different places. We've got like smaller towns and larger cities and really setting is kind of like another character. And then we talked about our protagonists and we talked about some of the side characters, but I want to talk about setting as character and how you chose your setting and for your series and then and why and what about it is just distinctive why don't you start this time Jen? yeah oh okay um so for this the entire series is la right which i, I love and i love being able to create like this urban place but then also just venture out to the different pockets and neighborhoods of Los Angeles and that have kind of distinctive personality so i feel like i do that throughout the series and then for the third book, meaning the cracks of code, there's Catalina Island is, and it's just like a, you know, hop and a skip away from Los Angeles. And I really wanted to showcase it because it's got, like, it's got lovely architecture. It's just, this is actually, you know, like a casino building, which is not a casino. It's just called the casino building. <laughs> um, and had a ballroom and it's just beautiful on the island. And it's got a quaint area in Avalon where there's all these cute shops and I just wanted to get that vibe into the story and it was nice to have the back and forth between mainland Los Angeles and then Catalina Island. Very cool. Okay so Elle do you want to talk? Oh well you know I it's um the Cajun Country Mysteries is really very setting based literally it's called the location so that tells you how um invested in the setting I was and that gave me a chance it really gives me a chance to write about the atmosphere and and the weather and the environment which is really special to me and um with the uh catering hall series it's like it's what I grew up with and it's so fun it's like when I write the book, I'm reliving my life, although there were no uh, murders in my life, thank God. Um, but, you know, when my character takes the subway, gets off the subway and walks home, well, that's what I, you know, the path I walked to visit my nonna. Um, like I said, we had our uh, reception at, um, at the place, the Grand Bay Marina. So it's super, super special to me. And, and there's one place, there's a bakery that we used to go to um, that is the real bakery, La Guli in Astoria. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's really special to write about a place that that's per, that's so personal to me. I'm really enjoying that. And also creating, as I do with LA, Jen, you know, creating the sense of cozy. It's about community. It doesn't have to be a small town. Um, New York, I mean, in, in Manhattan or wherever, it's, it's just a series of small communities and, um, tapping into that is really fun. All right, now I'm gonna I'm gonna point to someone. I'm pointing to Cynthia. <laughs> I'm wrangling with my mute thing. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, like Ellen, my series is called the Starlit Bookshop Mystery. So it's definitely set in the bookshop and foregrounding the bookshop. And it is um, it is a place of my dreams. I put everything in there that I could imagine. Um, there's chandelier lights that have stars to go with the family's name, their last name is stars. There's a spiral staircase, there's a mezzanine. The front of the building is all glass, but it has a beautiful stained glass piece that her father made. Um, and it looks, by the way, you're gonna be confused if you think it's gonna look like this. There is some artistic <laughs> license that was taken <laughs> here, um, but that's okay. You get two experiences, I guess, instead of one. Um, 
Silvercrest, the town, I, it's, an, it's an artisan center. So there's all kinds of different artists there. There's musicians and people who blow glass and people who do other sculptures and painting and, it's, and people come from around Colorado to shop there. Um, I tried to make it like the coziest, most artsy place of my dreams. And there's a river that runs through it. It's right in the foothills. So the mountains are in the west and right between the town and the mountains is this river. Um, that runs be behind Main Street. So it's behind the stores where the bookshop is. Um, I just, th that actually was inspired by Estes Park and oh. Morrison, Colorado, both of which have a little river or creek that runs past it. Um, and you can go shop and stroll around and it's just amazing and peaceful. So that's, um, that's where I set this imaginary story. A place I'd want to spend time and read books. That's basically yeah. where it comes from. Oh, and it's set in Colorado because it's a lot easier when you're writing. I found anyway, a book to, to be, oh, it's May. Here's what the weather's like. Oh, here's the road. I know where that is. So although I make up imaginary towns, I know the rest of the environment well enough to make those little decisions, which I think is important. So, you know, so interesting you say that, because like with my, you know, a, with the book one is fictional so that's fun i can do whatever i want um but when i'm dealing with reality and i'm in my new series which is set in new orleans too it's like sometimes i have to like do use google maps yeah. like if i'm getting them from a story out to long island okay so i know all the roads from my childhood and from my you know for my life but i don't i can do it by i don't know what they're called i just got on them exactly you know what this um this this series the lila mclean series this started out being in upstate New York, which is where I'm from. And I couldn't remember what the roads were called or what anything was like. So I thought, oh, Colorado sounds like I'll just move it here. But um, that took an entire year to, to make that decision because I kept writing in New York. So I go back to Colorado. I don't know. So That's anyway, funny. it is what it is. I like yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys. It's, uh, it's, it's much, I, I'm born and mostly raised in Colorado. And uh, so I know it very well. And um, both my series are set here. My uh, mystery writers uh, series is set more in the Metro Denver area, um, but I really, I try and shy away from using specific places. You know, sometimes um, like in one of the books, there was a, uh, you know, a car chase scene. And so I did use real street names. Um, which was kind of complicated, you know, because if you know it, it you know, you're, if you know the area, you might be following along in your head, you know, as this happens. And if you if you're not from around here, you don't care, you know, but I, I felt uh, very much like I had to get it exactly right, you know, and, and I could because I mean, I, if, if I could literally <laughs> go out my driveway and <laughs> actually drive these streets, you know? So I knew that it was right, but that's very, that makes me very, very nervous. For the um, crossword mysteries, I made up a town um, that's kind of set on the Eastern Plains. I'm pointing East right now. So, you know, that's East. Um, set on the Eastern Plains. It's, if you know Colorado, it's, it's kind of Lyman. I used the map of Lyman. I changed all the street names and, you know, just made up my own. But um, it's a it's a it's a way out um, on the lanes with intersecting right past it. So um, so there's a lot of people coming and going. I did take some of it because they have to go into Denver quite a bit, um, and otherwise it's it's too far to go. So um, I put it a little bit closer to Denver. Maybe I moved Denver closer to that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure which. But like Cynthia, I like knowing what the flora and fauna is, what it smells like here, what's growing, what um, you know, what what the weather's like. You know, in Police Navidad, you know, it, there's weather's involved in this because it's a Christmas book, so of course. Although this Christmas we probably won't have any, won't have any snow. Um, but I do, I do feel strongly that I, I, I don't think I could write if I didn't know a, a lot about the area that I'm writing about. I do want to ask about writing process, but I want to hold that thought for a moment because I also want to talk about chicks on the case. Yes, we all blog there, and. Yay! I want to kind of chat about what we love about it. Um, what what is our blog about? What's our goal? And so, if I we can. have a blog, what? 
And we have two of our fellow blogmates, Leslie Carson, yeah. Lisa Matthews are here with us. So, um, hey guys, you know, I, uh, Lisa and I were two of the founding members, actually Lisa more so than me, she brought me in. And I, I think it's, you know, for me, it's, you know, first of all, we're a little great community of, of writers I'm so proud to be, you know, connected with because everyone is so good. Um, and not all writers are so good. So it's really nice to know that <laughs> I'm part of this uh, group because it, you know, it raises my bar. Um, you know, I've got a lot to, to keep up with, with your talent and, you know, a light, you know, for me, I think to feel like the posts are light and fun and, um, and just somewhere to kind of like, I, I like people to feel like they're joining us when we comment, we we talk back and forth with people who comment on it. Um, what about you guys? What's your feeling about I feel, it? I feel the same way. Like it's a conversation. Like yes, exactly. I couldn't remember that word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're doing right now ellen we're having a conversation i'm so thrown by my geriatric dog <laughs> and it's it's taken a you lot know, out of me the thing i like too about the chicks you know that the outward community i love being part of the cozy community of readers yeah. but on a personal note it's been such a joy to um to get to know all the chicks personally because you might imagine we have a lot of conversations on our own as well <laughs> lots of them so um so i like both those you know kind of the front facing and the rear facing um, parts of chicks and i just love that people you know we have so many people who want to be guests at chicks because they want to be part of the community and we have all those readers who comment because they want to be part yeah. of the community too and i just think that's really lovely I agree. I so I'm like the newest chick on the case, I guess. And even though I was invited pretty much, you know, we're in pandemic and I I think Ellen, you might be the only one that I've actually met in person. Oh uh, I think. Oh, you really Becky, well, Becky was at you were at uh um Left Coast, right? Weren't you guys? Did we all meet at up at Left Coast or were you not there, Jen? I was I was, I dropped in and then I dropped back out because everything shut down. Yeah. So uh, maybe yeah, we I were only, we were Leslie, only. Leslie was there. Uh -huh. Leslie was my roommate. Leslie and I were going from one uh, museum to another, blithely wandering through San Diego <laughs> as they were panicked, shutting them down as we walked out. You know, and they'd be like, we're like, la 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 la. And then they're like, close it, close it. Oh yeah, I saw, I think I saw you walk walking by maybe <laughs> as they were put, putting the posters that yeah oh, the way we got to close down this conference um but anyway be, besides that even though i think i've mostly seen you all virtually it's just been amazing to have this community and just to have that i think sisterhood almost right it, um, as bloggers and on the blog and so thank you I really appreciate that. Yay. And of course, the community of the readers and everyone, I, I see all these comments in the chat from um, people who are commenting how they, they like visiting the chicks. Everyone everyone said everything that I, <laughs> that I would say. <laughs> I, I was so honored to be invited and um, I love all of you so, so much. And I love talking to everyone who comes to our blog and the guests uh, who, I just got a little choked up, sorry. <laughs> Well, that's actually, I'm going to jump in for a sec while you, you're verklempt while you recover and say that one thing that, you know, people are here should know too, is that we support each other um, personally as well. And, uh, and, and that's really been a help. And I think that's what's so great about this whole mystery community. I feel like we are all so there for each other, you know, coming from my TV background where, where everyone was like basically competition, you know, cause it was such a, to gain a seat at the table at any writer's table is so competitive. It's, it's really been like, a life changer to feel supported and to be able to support for readers and a fellow authors. So you feeling better, Sin? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I wanted to go back to the guest, uh, the guest thing too. We have so oops, did I just mute myself? Okay. No. Sorry. Nope. I have yeah. used, I don't know what's going on. It's my book, book birthday. My adrenaline is all over the place. Sorry about that. <laughs> um also I didn't sleep last night. So um 
it's so incredible to talk with the guests that come to visit us yeah. um, and to, to talk with the readers who are talking to the guests that come to visit with us. It feels like such a genuine community. And anyone who's out there, please come and hang out with us. We yeah. post Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We love to talk to everybody. Um, and we talk about mysteries, but we also talk about life. And um, the thing that I love, maybe even uh, the most, aside from all the love, I just have the love for all the things, but... <laughs> I love that it's that it's um, humorous that we that we're we're humorous mystery writers. So things are like Ellen said, they're light and fun, and we just um, we have a really good time. So. And Leslie just wrote, I just saw some of the best stuff is in the comments. Absolutely, yes. we have little comment conversations, and you know people because uh, everyone who follows us seems to be a talented writer, and and whether they're pursuing a career as an author or not, you know it's the comments are wonderful. So the readers talented readers too yes well that i mean readers who also are happen to be writers in their own way so i think if you read as much as all of us do you also develop an ability to write whether you're pursuing a profession you know as a uh, author career or not that's kind of what i meant am i making any sense jen help me out Jump in <laughs> you're making sense. i'm gonna segue off of your comment so okay. that's great so, it's been a, it's been great for me to uh, to meet all the guests um all the guest uh chicks because you know, I, I know their names and I, I've met lots of them, but there's always something a little bit deeper about what they write about when they're the, when they have a guest blog. So you just learn a little bit more about people that you've known for kind of a long time, which I find really, really fun. So I we could talk all night about chicks. <laughs> we, we probably could. OK, but I wanted to piggyback on what um, Ellen was saying about learning about I, what you're saying too, Becky, about learning about writing and doing that and kind of just getting inspired by our guests too. Yeah. And that is how do we go about writing? You know, what are the, what's our writing process like? And you can talk about, you know, how our tagline is mystery writers with a killer sense of humor. So you can talk about humor in our books or you could talk about how do you even go from blank page to an actual manuscript? Well, what's your process? My, what is my process? <laughs> uh, uh -huh. I, you know what? I, I used to, I think I'm a planter, so I'm plotter, but also pantser. And I'm a little more plotter now, but I think it's because I have outlines and synopses that I need to turn in <laughs> to my editor. But I, I like to have like an overarching view of what happens. And then I give it wiggle room. So I'll be like scene by scene or chapter by chapter. I give it a little bit of structure, but a, a little bit of wiggle room for some like organic stuff to come out too but cool. I used to be definitely less uh structured I think and it was like I will shock the reader and shock myself by figuring out <laughs> all, I'm gonna, all this happens I'm gonna jump in here because uh I this is my feeling um I'm an outliner and I think it comes uh, when I was a playwright, I was much less so, but if from my TV background, because um, outlining is part of the payment structure that you cannot move on to script until the outline is approved. So it's kind of ingrained in me. And, um, and I call it a fluid outline because I will find things that I didn't know I was going to find. I've even introduced new characters entire, entirely, but I usually work from like a 35 or 45 page outline and, um, and pray that the book grows because it's often short. Uh, but, oh shoot, I was going to say something on top of that. What did you just say? Oh, mm, okay. Someone else jump in. Cause I'm having a, a moment where I can't remember what else I was going to say. Well, I wrote a, I wrote a whole book about my process. So <laughs> That's right. Right. <laughs> I wrote a book called eight weeks to a complete novel, um, because I write pretty fast and it's because I outline and, uh, I am. Oh, look, it's, it's yeah, Leslie's holding it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, um, I basically, I follow um, Blake Snyder's screenwriting beats. He has, he studied uh, movies and he found that there's 15 commonality, common, common plot points that, that, every, um, that every movie needs. And when I started writing, I wrote for kids. And one of the things that, for reluctant readers specifically, and one of the things that I always told them was that you should be seeing a movie in your head as you read your book. And um, so I wanted to try and write that way too. And so I thought using a screenwriting tool like that would really be helpful. And it's very helpful. So, um, so I, I, I do the, I um, look through all those beats and like, like Alan, you know, 
people are scared of outlines, but outlines can be very organic. You know, I, I That's need it. to, um, I need, if, if I'm going to drive from Los Angeles to New York, I need a map. I, 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 I kind of want to know where I'm going to spend the night every night, but I don't know what kind of hotel it is. I, I know what town I'm going to be in at lunchtime, but I don't know what restaurant I'm going to have lunch in, those kinds of things. And that's how I feel like with my outline, you know, it's kind of a broad stroke kind of thing. And then as I work through, work through, work through, all the more interesting little details come out. So, mm-hmm. um, so I'm very much a plotter. I'm going to jump in because you made me remember I was going to say that I feel um, that my outline is organic. And like you Mm -hmm. said, and that I'm having and now I've come to think of it as my first draft, really, because when people say I want to be surprised, you know, as I'm writing, well, I am. It's just at the outline stage. And so when you think of it as um, a first draft, it just makes it suddenly so much part of the process. Well, and the thing I like about outlining, too, is that it's way easier to if, if you screw something up. Plot wise, yeah. it's way easier to fix 30 pages than 300 pages. And I've learned to send my 30 page um, outline synopsis um, to my friends and say, does this work? Because they can turn that really fast for me rather than sending them a whole 300 page manuscript that's already finished for them to find some screw up in chapter two <laughs> for me to fix. It's way easier for, to, to fix those 30 pages. So that's why I like an outline. Birthday girl. Birthday girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just sitting here thinking about I about the fact that I also use an outline, but Becky and I have had long arguments about what we need by outline. Discussion. Versus nine, million Discussion. <laughs> Versus nine million pages long. Mine is like a bullet list. I'll do 25 bullet points of what what can happen in 25 chapters and it won't even be a full sentence it'll be like <laughs> murder and then police come and it'll just be 20, 25 like plot points and then um and then I draft and I love to draft because because all kinds of things come in that I zero planning and it's very um it's very creative and exciting and I feel like I'm just joyfully keyboard pounding that's <laughs> just just la 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 here it's happening but when that's over I take the same um, I take that draft and I take the same outline I started with and revise it with what actually happens in the chapters and that becomes a timeline. And then I have, um, then I start to add the other things in as I need them, but it let, allows me to see the big structure. So I think I'm a lot like Jen. I just have that like timeline thing at the end. Um, yeah, and I'm constantly surprised when I write a book. In fact, the first book that I wrote, the killer changed halfway through and I thought, oh no, this is, I don't know where this is going now, but um but that gives me such sweaty palms when you say that. I just can't. I just no, I'm in charge. You're the killer. No, I'm not. Okay. All right. Um, but then but then the majority of the work for me happens in revision. I revise a lot, of, and I think probably all of us revise a lot, but I mean that's where the majority of the work happens for me. Once I have that first draft, I um I'm very diving in and changing things, which Becky, once you told me the thought of revising like that gave, made your palms sweaty, right? Oh, it makes me throw up in my mouth. Yeah. (laughs) I, the reason I plot so well at the, so heavily at the beginning is because I suck at revision. If I could, if I could figure out a a better way to do it, I would have done it that way to begin with. Uh, You know what? I I got to tell you. I actually do. I actually am a fan of writing a strong first draft and not where you get stuck. You never want to get stuck. But again, it's from my TV background, because one of the ways we got hired is the they would ask the agent, do they write strong first drafts? And they the agent would say yes. And then we'd have recommendations from past bosses who could back it up because when you're in production on a show you there is no I mean we have scripts that have gone straight to the table um because there's just no time you know you want the strongest first draft you can get um and it doesn't mean you know you can't I mean I do plenty of revision but but my my first draft is usually pretty solid although not so much with my new series that that editor just found us so many holes that I was like wow who wrote this I'm still apologizing I'm like oh I'm so I, sorry you know it's funny I have I have friends who just hate that first draft and I, I like that first draft and like Ellen I think of my outline um, I've begun to think of my outline as the first draft but they like just getting to the end just vomiting out words, 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 words. And then they take all those pages and they throw them up in the air and then they try and reassemble them. And I think, oh my God, mm. <laughs> that's just, that's just, it makes my heart stop a little. Yeah. 
Jen, uh, will you, how does, does any of this ring true for you? I, I, well, I have a question for you now that you have shared about your outlining processes. Oh, and also, yes, please feel free to put questions in the comments yeah. too. We'll get to those as well. Um, so my question is, so it sounds like you have like 35, 40 pages of outline, especially you, Elle. <laughs> how, doesn't that, I feel like then how can you possibly write short? And do you do each of you write short or longer than, you know, what you're aiming for? And then how do you deal with that? It, I'm always short. I, I don't know why, um, you know, it's, uh, and cause I write, have these thorough outlines. This, this, I was really happy that this draft came in at 69,000 words when I just finished, but I'm supposed to be at 75. I usually, I actually have my, uh, my editor, my agent, cross out um at crooked lane and and kensington i it was eighty thousand. and i make it 70 and they're cool with that mm -hmm. um but the new series of berkeley crime prime crime we had to negotiate and, and we ended up at 75 and those extra five thousand words are kicking my ass man i it's i know a thousand will be recipes so there we go just add more recipes. You get to count so now, i'm down to four thousand i'm down four thousand i'm down to so i didn't um, know that the recipes counted in the word count I need to start putting recipes. Well, you know, it's like it's like when you're selling you're selling a house, you're not supposed to count like the garage or something. So I I've turned in ones where I've like got a a, a thousand, you know, five hundred word acknowledgments to, you know, <laughs> trying to get over that finish line. Well, for me, Jen, I um I I write by the time I finish my outline and I get to the end of the draft, I'm at like 60,000 and I'm aiming at about 75 um, because, and, and I just, that, that thrills me because it is so much easier for me to add words than to subtract words. I can't, I, I can't imagine how hard it would be to write 100,000 and cut it back to 75 like some people do. I think that's just really complicated and time consuming. Um, but if you have a scene, well, gosh, you can, you can add tons of words in a million different ways. So I do like to write a little bit um, smaller um, so that I can add at the end and you know pad the places you can add humor you can add another subplot you can you know you can you just have all that freedom to do whatever you want um, to hit that word count okay i'm going to tell you all a secret in this book the third the secret uh the spirit in question i was so short on my draft after i'd revised it that i changed one of the characters names to have two names instead of one just to get more words <laughs> anyway you can have that's hilarious yeah anyway wow no, that is a great sheet i didn't even think of that <laughs> mark baker's now going to be going wait a minute how come it's now it was it was <laughs> carissa that was carissa may i was desperate that's hilarious <laughs> I actually did have um, with Long Island Ice Tina. It was my longest draft, my longest outline, and my shortest draft. It came in like at like fifty nine thousand or something, and like even Kensington is like, mm, no. So I was like, I you know it's like throw a body. So I didn't do a body, but I came up with another you know beat. Some guy got you know got slammed as well he should, but um, yeah, that's that's always terrifying. At the end, I'm like, oh, what a real look. Because I wanna, here's the other thing. Uh, one reason I really, I actually tr do contractually in all seriousness, try to adjust the word count is because I never want to um, have to f write to filler. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want it to be like, I'm just writing to add words because you can yeah. feel that in a book and it gets boring in my, in my opinion. Hmm. Good idea. So I see a couple of questions in the chat actually. Uh, well, one is, uh, what are your birth dates from Tracy? Not the year. And I think a couple of people had already answered. Um, what uh, are what? Your birth birth dates. dates. Oh. Not the year. Never the year. I, that's a that's you know what? I am proud to be 60 years old. I have earned every one of these gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> My birthday's in February, the 16th. I was I, I was almost a Valentine, but I was too ornery. So and then I said I'm October. And Sin said, um, July 4th. July 4th. With your fireworks birthday. <laughs> Easy to remember. Yes. Yeah. Everyone's always gone. It's hard to have a party. 
Oh, <laughs> everyone's had everyone's having a party for you. <laughs> That's what my parents told me that the nation was celebrating my birthday, but I knew that wasn't right. That, yeah. be right. <laughs> that okay. is a big birthday. It looks like Grace has a question. I, did we lose L? Grace has a question. She says, "How do you schedule your day, week, month when you work on multiple series? Mm -hmm. Working on the new book versus doing copy edits mm -hmm. or marketing, promoting." Um, all at once, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything. Uh, well, well, I'll, you start I'll tell you, this yeah. week I'm doing all three. I had this book come out, so I was doing all this launch stuff because it you you know you're going to do blog tour, you have to write guest posts and all this. It takes a long time to get right. Anyway, so I have that launch happening. Um, I'm working on a standalone that I started this um, this fall, and I just got notes for my second book in this series. So I'm doing all of that. This week, I don't know how, I feel a little crazy, um, but I just, each time there's a writing session, I just pick one of those things and kind of work on that. that. That's the only way I can think of to do it. I'm not somebody who can do one in the morning and one in the afternoon. I need to kind of have a day. So the question L is in the chat um, from Grace. How do you schedule your day, week, month when you work on multiple series, work on a new book versus doing copy edits or marketing promoting work on a recently published book? So how do we juggle it all, I guess? Oh, I'm sorry. For some reason, I've never dropped out before, but something happened with my internet. Um, I, I don't have a particular, I, I just, my natural schedule seems to be, I get up and I'm kind of getting my act together. And so I do a lot of social media then, and then I'll start writing. Um, and, you know, I, my goal is more like two, th when I'm working on a draft, it's 2000 words a day. And how I get there is, you know, if maybe 1500 at the minimum, but, um, uh, then however I get there is how I get there. If it means I have to like work late at night, I'll do that. Um, and then I put stuff aside if I need to do a, I, I have to do one project at a time. I can't, you know, I finish one, then I move on to the other. Um, and I don't have to work a day job right now, which really helps. This is my full-time job. When I was working on the last job I had, I was at Nickelodeon for three years and I wrote um, two or three books while I was there. I can't remember. And I, but I could only do one a year because I was writing in the morning or at night and, or on the weekends because my daughter was a teenager and really didn't need me or want me around much. So that freed up a lot of time. Uh, for me, what do I do? I have a pretty strict schedule. I'm a, you might have learned because of my crossword puzzling and such. Um, I, I do like a good schedule. Um, and my schedule stays the same most days. Uh, like Ellen, I'm a full-time writer. And so I'm at my desk by nine in the morning and I write until noon usually. Uh, so that's three hours. And then I have lunch. And then in the afternoon, I work on marketing or other stuff. Um, but every morning I write for three hours and I can get, I don't know, four or 5,000 words in that way. Um, but I do, I, I, I keep track on every book. Um, every hour I stop and I write down how much I wrote. Um, and I stop and take a five minute dance break or something, you know, roll my wrists and try and stay healthy. Um, but I, I, I'm a morning person. And so by 4.30 in the afternoon, when my dog tells me it's dinner time, I'm kind of done for the day. Those people who like, I know Cynthia has told me she's been writing at like two in the morning or something. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even, I can't even picture anything like that for me. I, I'm brain dead by 4.30 or five. So that's, I'm, well, I'm hold done. On though. I have a teaching job. I have to I teach during the day. So I don't know how you do, I don't know how you do any of it. Yeah. It's not a good habit. No, you're right. I don't sleep. You're right. But I, if, but I have to find a window sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I, yeah, I keep my morning hours for, well, I try to keep my morning hours for writing and the afternoons more for like the promoting marketing. And I, well, I was going to tell, say to Grace that like this, this month I thought I could do, I don't know why I thought I could do this. I thought I could do I thought I could host Thanksgiving and have these two books come out, Midnight Hour Anthology <laughs> and Mimi Lee Cracks a Code and do NaNoWriMo, um, of which I was also doing write-in events for Sister in, Sisters in Crime. And, but then 
I guess I'm a nano rebel because I definitely did not make the 50,000 words. Yeah. Uh, I was aiming for at least half of that and did not make, make that either. Um, and what, and then on top of that, I got uh, copy edits for, you know, book one in my new series, LA Night Market <laughs> Mystery. So I was like, I don't, I don't think I could, <laughs> I could get that work out. Yeah. You know, when I say I, I write every morning, uh, that's not true because I had, um, this book come out on the, like, the first week in November and this one come out weeks later and I haven't really done much <laughs> writing. <laughs> so, but that's kind of built into my schedule. I also have this, you guys are going to think I'm so anal about everything, but I have this huge wall sized um, dry erase uh, calendar and and I write in all my due dates and um, the days I have to start something and you know all that kind of stuff gets programmed in there and so I knew that I had two books coming out so I knew that there wasn't going to be a new book being started right then I am kind of noodling over this one that's already in the work so you know you have all this 24 hours a day I we're all thinking about books, yeah. whether it's the one we're working on, the one we're, you know, outlining or actively writing or editing or marketing. It's it's all this constant churn going on that just doesn't turn off for me anyway. Um, but I do kind of have a big picture for my year. So that kind of keeps it in check a little bit. Yeah, it's I keep it more in my head or in my day book. I, I have to a lot of this creates anxiety for me. So I'm always trying to like not have anxiety. So that's why I'm always trying to beat deadlines. I and mean, that's just always been how I work, you know, for in TV and when I was writing for magazines. Otherwise, I start getting anxious and then I freeze up. So I don't I, I do whatever I can to avoid that. So, hey, do we want to talk a little about, you know, because we have this wonderful Creating Conversations, a bookstore that um, is kind enough to host us about how you could get our books as gifts uh, for under $30. Should we talk about that? Yes, go for it, Elle. Okay. Start the bottle <laughs> Yes, start the bottle running. <laughs> okay, I just want to share that uh, you can buy all three of my uh, get. Creating Hall Mysteries as a gift, as a set for under $30. Next. <laughs> well, I didn't, I don't have a pretty red ribbon around mine. Oh. But the first book, oh, let's see. It, 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 it. The first books in my series, Fiction Can Be Murder and Puzzling Inc., you can get series starter gift pack under $30. Next. Um, I'll go, but I don't, I don't <laughs> think I have a $30. Well, okay. So can I do two, two sassy cat ah. mysteries for $32? That counts. Um, it's close enough. Or you could do a sassy you cat mystery. Some of the pages in the back. Yeah. Sassy cat mystery and um, a pre-order of Death by Volte here. Look, I even printed out the cover for my, my next yeah, oh. book in the new series. Oh, that's so Death exciting. Bubble Beautiful. Tea, book one. So I guess you could get, you know, a yeah. sassy cat now and then a uh, night market mystery later. Oh, <laughs> Sin. Oh, all right. Well, you can get this. Yes, one beautiful, <laughs> no, beautiful a beautiful book. Hardcover, hardcover book. Or, or you could get two Lila McLean books or one Lila McLean book and the and the audio of that Ooh, or the Kindle of that. Audio. <laughs> so yes, because we want to support our indie bookstores and, and the kind uh, cre creating conversations hosts tonight. Yes. Thank you so much. And I saw that creating conversations also had um, possible pre-order links too. Yes. Um, so since they have them up, I also want to ask what is next for you? And I see book by thief is on there. So oh. uh, Elle, do you want to start? Sure. About and I have a cover. This is uh, the cover nice. for Bayou Book Thief. And it's set in the Garden District. It's uh, my character opens a um, vintage cookbook and uh, kitchenware shop at a culinary house museum in the Garden District in New Orleans. Inspired by my own vintage cookbooks, I'll show you one of them. I buy these and I don't cook from them, although there will be <laughs> recipes. I've had to use some. This is my favorite. It's Photo Place Cookbook of the Stars, 150 Recipes of the Stars. It's from 1928. And so if you want John Barrymore's a recipe for spaghetti, let me know. 
<laughs> What's up for you, Cynthia? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, sorry, I, I was thinking about, I was doing the math in my head for what you could actually buy for under $30 with mine. I'm like, I don't even know how much a CD costs. Like, maybe that's not true. So anyway, that's what I was thinking about. Um, what's, what's coming up next? I'm working on the second book in the Starlet Bookshop Mysteries. I do not have a cover yet, um, but I have a title. It's called In the Event of Murder because Ooh, they're oh, Yeah, that's, that's great. Stay tuned. <laughs> I'm working on a standalone that I just got back to. I wrote it kind of, a, what, a, maybe a year ago, maybe not that long ago, but it's been a while. <laughs> it's been way too long, but it didn't work, right? I, there was something wrong with it. And so um, so I'm redoing it. And I've, I've been studying some uh, Leanne Moriarty books. Um, and I so this one's going to be um, I'm going to I'm going to steal from the best and turn this into a multiple point of view book. It's uh, all these it's a closed house mystery kind of thing. Um, so I'm excited about that. It's kind of it looks a little bit darker than than a cozy, but um, not too dark. That's it's great. I got to read it. It's hey. wonderful. Hey, Thank Jen. you. Oh, me. So Okay, Death by Bolt Tea, it's book one in the LA Night Market mystery series. And it's about two cousins who run a food stall in the Los Angeles night market. And one of their customers winds up dead. So they have to, you know, clear their name and figure out what's really going on. Um, and I want to read these wonderful blurbs that I got from uh. some lovely authors that you might know. So this one from Ellen Byron, or Maria Tirico, but I put Ellen Byron. Appealing characters and the alluring setting of a night market make Death by Bubble Tea a delicious page turner of a mystery. And there's special guest Leslie Karst, who says, as addictive as shrimp dumplings and sticky rice in lotus leaves, mm -hmm. Jennifer J. Chow's Death by Bubble Tea will provide a delightful treat for lovers of culinary cozies. With its intrepid sleuth and vividly drawn setting, this clever whodunit will have you greedily turning the pages for more. So, Yay. thanks for the blurbs. Yay. And we should also say, and Mary Elizabeth is back, that Jen and I will be there and we will be at Creating Conversations in person on Thursday for a meet and greet. And I am making cookies from uh, the recipe, one of the recipes from this book. And I'm making a candy that's a recipe from this book. Wow. I will be not making cookies, but bringing three <laughs> packages. You can get that recipe about John Perry more spaghetti. Bring that, Jen. Yeah, that's true. Oh, I don't know. It sounds tough. <laughs> I bring in pre-packaged snacks and goodies. <laughs> and oh, Becky and I sent some swag. We did. We sent some things because we could yes. there. Yes. Yes. yes, there is there is swag available uh, as well as book plates. I think both of you sent fun additional goodies, and that's appreciated. And um, it would be wonderful if people are in the LA area, if you wanna come visit us in South Bay, LA, we are in Redondo Beach and uh, we look forward to seeing you all. But in the meantime, um, it is now 6.30 Pacific time and a lot of delicious food has been discussed and <laughs> has been discussed. And I think that is our cue to wrap up our evening with the chicks. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you to our attendees Thank you guys. for making time for in your December to join us. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Always fun. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>